Okay, we are on to part two of Function of Water and Foods, and we're going to be thinking about the solvent properties of water and the fact that water is the universal solvent in virtually all food systems, and as such, it has a lot of interesting properties. We're going to think about the colligative properties of solutions and the fact that usually when we've got water in foods, we've got things dissolved in that water, and when we've got things dissolved, it modifies the properties of the water itself. And so as food scientists, we're constantly manipulating macromolecules in foods. And so let's think about how we're manipulating water in particular. So at the end of this video, you will discuss the molecular structures of water within foods under different physical states. As you know, water exists in all three physical states very commonly within foods as a solid, an ice form, as a liquid, and as a gas, as steam. And so it's worth thinking about each of these states. We're going to describe sensible and latent heat as they impact the physical states of water. And we'll describe how molecules in solution interrupt the typical structure of pure water, changing the energy required to change state. We'll define the colligative properties of solutions and explain food applications that take advantage of these colligative properties. So that's a lot of big words. And again, my approach is always to take it, uh, take it straightforward, step by step, using really plain language so that everyone can understand where we're heading. So let's jump right in here. So we talked a little bit about this before. Water is a very important solvent. And so we'll talk about what a solvent is in just a few moments. But if you think about it, a solvent really means that it's dissolving stuff. And water dissolves a lot of small molecules. In general, waters that are uh, polar or waters, or pardon me, <laughs> water is good at uh, dissolving polar molecules. It's very good at dissolving molecules with molecular charge. Water influences structure of large molecules, things like proteins and polysaccharides. And so because of these, uh, the large molecular structure, there tends to be a bit of charge on most large molecules. And as such, it can be part of... Uh, either increasing the solubility or plasticizing those large molecules. Water is part of emulsions, and we will have a different slideshow talking about um, emulsions and dispersions at a later point. And water is also contained in cell structures and tissues. And each of these structures is important to note because we are influencing all of these as food scientists. So thinking about water, water, obviously, as we have discussed, comes in food systems in ice. It comes as liquid water and it comes as steam in a, in a number of different uh, process applications. And so it's worth thinking about the structure of all of these. In the case of water in solid ice, you've got, I'm, I, I've got my Wacom board here. So you've got this crystalline lattice forming across these molecules. That's organizational structure based off of the dipole moments. We remember from the previous, the previous um, slideshow, we talked about the fact that water molecules, these um, oxygen has a net negative charge. So if, I, if I'm gonna put the dipole negative and we've got a, a, we got a dipole positive on these hydrogens, I'm just gonna put a positive there. Because of that dipole moment in water, it forms these wonderful crystalline lattices in the case of ice. What's happening with liquid water, we still have some of that organization. And so those positives and negatives tend to want to interact with each other, but it's much looser. And then in the case of a gas, the, um, the molecules of water have escaped into the atmosphere and they're free floating, but at the same time, they're still interacting with one another. They're just much more loosely aggregated. But we still think about those dipole moments. I'm gonna, we still think about those dipole moments in water and every one of those molecules because that dipole interaction allows 
the solute, the things that were dissolving in water, to interact with the water molecules itself. So, in the case of water, we have heat going on, and 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 this and and you don't think about it when you're thinking about ice and snow and cold, but there's heat energy in there, and depending on the quantity of heat energy, you have to think about the fact that in the case, let's let's say for example you have water, if you are changing state, you go from a sensible or something that you can actually measure on a thermometer, the heat energy that you put in there is sensible heat initially, and then if you are in the process of going through a change of state, that heat goes into what's called latent heat, and this is the heat that breaks the bonds between, if we go back here, it breaks, latent heat is the is the energy that breaks these bonds and allows the water to go into this disaggregated state. Or latent heat is the heat that goes into breaking the bonds that are here and allowing the molecules to escape into the atmosphere in the case of going into the gaseous form or gas form. So going back to here, sensible heat, the heat causes a change in temperature. In the case of latent heat, it breaks bonds to change the state of this product. So every, everything that we are dealing with in normal human systems has heat, even things that are cold and frozen. If you think about, uh, you likely have done it at some point, it, when you think about uh, temperatures, we are here in Canada usually talking in Celsius, but oftentimes scientists will deal with things in Kelvin. It's only things that are at zero degrees Kelvin that there is no heat at all. And that is like minus 273 degrees Celsius. So we are really not ever dealing with that. All molecules have energy and we are observing that either in sensible heat or in latent heat that is that heat that allows us to break molecular bonds to change states. So let's move forward here. Now, why are we worried about solvents and solutes and solutions? Well, let's quickly remind ourselves about the terminology. In the case of solvent, we mentioned this the other time. I've got my wake on board. I'm excited to try it out. Solvents are things that are dissolving solutes. So one of our most basic example of a solution would be to mix salt and water together to have salt water. And now we have a solution. We are somehow going about using the solvent properties and diluting, or not diluting, dissolving, pardon me, dissolving that solute into the solvent to create a solution. Let's think about what's going to happen molecularly to that structure. So, oh no, I want a different slide here. I'm going to go back to that slide. We have this wonderful organized lattice structure in the case of ice. We've got a reasonably organized structure in the case of liquid water and much more disaggregated up here, but we've got this, this gas function. Now, Thinking about it, when you put a solute into a solution, so let's say we've got sodium chloride here. Sodium chloride is table salt. What's happening is we've got this sodium here, and, and, and it's hard to see in this image, sodium, it's Na positive. That positive is causing the water molecules and their dipole moments to all point in a very discrete direction. And so we start to get this solvation structure occurring within the solution. And so we had gone from this wonderful, very organized situation to a new type of organization that's modifying the properties of the water. Same with the chloride here. So that's chloride and again, it's changing the dipole moment and its orientation within the water. And so suddenly, 
how how do we go about breaking the bonds to go between that crystalline lattice here to here or vice versa going from liquid water and losing heat losing latent heat to form that lattice structure here if it's got different organization those properties are going to be modified and that is what we call the colligative properties so let me jump back where did my slide go so this is a really wordy slide and let's just walk through this and I will give you some examples. So the colligative properties of solution. First off, when we have that solute in the solution, it's going to lower the vapor pressure of the solvent. What does that mean? It's going to be harder for molecules to escape from the solution and get into the atmosphere because they're bound into that uh, water of solvation around the solute. It's going to raise the boiling point of the solvent because it's going to take more energy for that molecule of water to escape from the solute. It's going to reduce or lower the freezing point of the solvent, so it's going to be harder to make ice because again the solute is disrupting the water's ability to make those lovely lattice structures that otherwise known as ice. Last but not least, this one's the, the, the weirdest one to wrap your head around, but it modifies the osmotic pressure of the solvent. And what this really means is it changes how the water flows across the cell membranes in plant and animal cells. And we do take advantage of this. So let's walk through each of these examples with a little bit more detail. So when we've got that pure solvent, we've got really normalized interaction between the water molecules or whatever the solvent is. And in the case of food, 99% of the time it's water. But the moment we introduce solute into the solution, so salts or sugars, we are interrupting that molecular structure and we are throwing off the energy patterns to be able to form either ice and uh, the crystalline structures or we are throwing off the patterns for water to be able to escape and evaporate or uh, as part of water activity or we're seeing the, the change in boiling temperature. So here's, a, here's another diagram to uh, exemplify this. So we've got pure water and the water is going to predictably, based off of the known energy, it's going to predictably be able to evaporate off. And in the, as soon as we're adding sugar, so we've got sucrose represented here by these red dots, the water wants to form, if you recall that previous diagram, it forms those, those uh, solvation forms around the sugar molecules. And it's, it's, it becomes energetically difficult for the water to escape into the atmosphere. And so we see less water escaping. Think about it. So think about water activity. We've talked about water activity and I have another video, those of you who are following along from Niagara College will have in your blackboard another video about water activity and it's on my YouTube channel as well. But if you think about it, if we're putting solute into the solution, we're reducing the water's ability to escape and participate. So we're reducing the water activity. And how many times, for those of you who are in my product development class, do I go and say, change the colligative properties because it's going to reduce your water activity and reduced water activity is going to give you increased shelf life and reduced microbial outgrowth. So changing the solute in your solution is going to reduce your water activity. This diagram can also be used for boiling point. And so honestly, when you see the ability energetically of those water molecules to escape to the atmosphere, if you have solute in your solution, it's going to become energetically more difficult. Thus, you need more heat energy to have that change in state from liquid to gas. So we're seeing a boiling point increase. If you remember, those of you who are in the chemistry class, we were boiling sugar to make hard candy and the water 
we, we kept saying the sugar's not boiling, the water is boiling. And the, as the sugar concentration got higher, the boiling point kept increasing. We were able to boil up into the 150, 160, 180 degrees Celsius. Why? Because as that sugar became more concentrated, the water was interacting even more intently with the sugar and it became energetically even more difficult. So we needed to apply even more heat to get the water off of that solution. Now, here is an example of osmotic modification. Now, in the case of osmosis, we've got what's called a semi-permeable membrane. Animal cells, plant cells, these all have that cell membrane that allows water to flow back and forth. And depending on the osmotic properties, so how much solute do we have in the solution or outside the solution, is there more solute in, uh, usually what we're looking at is isotonic. That's where it's balanced, it's equal. And here we've got more water outside of the cell than inside. And so you'll note there's this, uh, how, do we, how do we change this? We can change this by changing the solute. Uh, no, ah, I'm messing this up. In the case of hypertonic, you've got more concentration of solute outside the membrane. So note all that, all that particle there is solute. And because all the solute, the uh, solute is high here and solute is low here, the water travels across the membrane to balance it out. In the case of hypotonic, there's more solute inside and the water travels from the outside to the inside to balance it out. Now, from a cellular perspective, if you are in isotonic, that's where it's the, that's where in biological systems the cell turgor pressure is balanced. Now, we can change the solute characteristics on the outside of cells and it will draw water out. And we actually do take advantage of this when it comes to um, osmotic dehydration of fruits and vegetables. So if you were to take, let's say you were at a cranberry factory, you could take the cranberries and put them into a, a highly concentrated sugar solution and the cranberries will dry out. Some of the sugar will migrate across the membrane into the, into the cranberry, but more water actually flows out. You can then take that sugar syrup and use it for making cranberry juice or cranberry jelly and you've got partially dehydrated fruit that's and it's done energy in an, an extremely energetically um, advantageous way it dehydrates the fruit now in other cases you can take uh, you could be causing damage to a food system by mishandling this so for example in the case of brining or washing meat oftentimes i hear about um food processors who want to uh, temper their meat by just running it a uh, meat block underwater. And that meat block underwater, you are losing the cellular contents because if you're just running tap water on it, the cells oftentimes will take up that water swell and burst. And you're going to lose the cellular contents. And as such, you're going to lose flavor and you're going to lose protein content and so on. The cells in the case of animal cells, because of the, um, change in the turgor pressure, too much water on the outside of the cells and it will flood into the cells and the cells can actually burst. In the case of fruits and vegetables, you can take advantage that they not only have a cell membrane, but they have a cellulosic cell wall and you could put fruits and vegetables into a hypotonic or mostly water solution and the water will migrate into the cells causing an increase of texture and crispness because those cells stiffen up. So let's think about the colligative properties of solutions. Without delving into a, a lot of hard math, the challenge with colligative properties, it's not just the mass, so the weight, if I can use that term, it's not the mass of molecules that are in the solution, it's actually the number 
the mo uh, the molality or the molarity of the solution, not the mass. And so the you have to think about it from a particle basis. The more solute poly particles that are in the present uh, in present in that solvent, the greater the effect. So. You have to think of moles of dissolved solute, not grams of dissolved solute. Now, this is really interesting to think about because more particles, the greater effect, and we have to think about dissociation factors. So in the case of salts or electrolytes, things like sodium chloride that break apart, you, you could have sodium chloride going in, but in water, it's actually going to dissociate to Na plus and Cl negative. And so we actually have two, two particles in there. In the case of, let's say, calcium chloride, let's walk through this one as well. Calcium chloride is, is actually, it, so calcium is a divalent cation, and then we've got two chloride negative. So we actually here, we have three dissociation factor. We have to think very deliberately about the number of particles and not the mass of, of the product. So once upon a time, long time ago, uh, a good example, ice cream manufacturers, they would be using sucrose and Sucrose would not have quite the same colligative properties, whereas if you were to use invert sugar, so sucrose is a disaccharide, instead they would use invert. Now more often they're switching over to high fructose corn syrup because here you've got one, you've got one dissociation factor, invert sugar, Mass for mass, you actually have two dissociation factor because you're taking that sucrose and you're making glucose and fructose. So gram for gram, you're getting very similar sweetness properties, but in the case of the colligative properties, so freezing point depression, the ability to scoop that ice cream, you now have Two, uh, two dissociation factor, and so you might have a much better freezing point depression, allowing for scoopability of that ice cream. Now, that said, we've, we've had these discussions in class before too. People like to see on their label, made with cane sugar rather than made with invert sugar. These are the sorts of balances that you have to uh, think about as a product developer that you can take advantage of the colligative properties. Are there other types of ingredients that have good colligative properties that can uh, that can work in the same way? So let's do a quick summary here. Colligative properties, they lower the vapor pressure of solvent. So in, we see this in decreased water activity. Because the water is in that uh, water of solvation rather than in its normal lattice or, crystal, or um, solution form, the water it has a challenge to escape to the atmosphere, so that is decreased water activity. It raises the boiling point of the solvent, and so it takes more sensible heat for the water to change from liquid or liquid to solid, not liquid to solid, <laughs> liquid to gas. And so we see this in a higher boiling point. I better go back and change that in the slides. So it takes more energy or sensible heat to get the water from liquid to gas. And as such, that change in sensible heat is a higher boiling point. And we see, we've see we seen this in candy making. We ch it can lower the freezing point of a solvent. So um, it disrupts the ability of the water to form that crystalline form. So it has to have a, a lower sensible te temperature to crystallize. And we see this as freezing point depression. And a good example would be ice cream, where it's a semi-solid frozen, and to be scoopable, it has to be partly, partly frozen and partly liquid to be scoopable. Last but not least, modifying the osmotic pressure of a solvent. So in this case, we're uh, 
seeing this by changing the turgor pressure in cells. So uh, in the previous slideshow, for example, we talked about limp celery. And if we put that limp celery back in some fresh water, the celery's turgor pressure is going to increase and we'll see an improvement in crispness. Whereas um, we can use osmotic dehydration for certain fruits and vegetables and dehydrate them by putting them in very concentrated sugar solutions to draw the water out. So let's leave you with an ice cream sundae because the ice cream sundae is a great example of all of these different properties. The cherry on the top, if it's a maraschino or a glacé type cherry, it is osmotically dehydrated. We've taken those cherries and ran them through a variety of concentrated sugar solutions that then, uh, through osmotic dehydration, swaps the water out with sugar and dehydrates that product. In the case of the, uh, the candy syrup, and it could be a caramel or a chocolate syrup, we likely had boiling point increase when boiling the sugar for that syrup. And in the case of the ice cream, we got freezing point depression. So we have all sorts of different colligative properties on display in a delicious food system here. And again, this is something that you're manipulating all the time. And we want to take advantage of our good knowledge of colligative properties so that we can get the best advantage, water activity, on boiling point, osmotic, and freezing point. I'm having fun with this Wacom board. Anyways, I always love to hear from you. Ask questions, send me your comments, send me suggestions for my next video, and you know I always love to hear from you. Take care and we'll talk soon.